Hello, I'm Joy Stockbauer with Family Research Council, and joining me today is Dr. Ben Carson. Dr. Carson is a world-renowned neurosurgeon and served as the 17th Secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. He performed the first successful separation of Siamese twins joined at the back of the head in 1987 and served as Director of Pediatric Neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins. Today, he leads the American Cornerstone Institute, which seeks to advance the principles that have guided him through life and that make this country great. Faith, liberty, community, and life. Dr. Carson, it is an honor to speak with you today. Thank you, thank you for having me. Now, throughout your time in the public square, you have often affirmed your pro-life stance and made some very persuasive arguments for the importance of protecting unborn children. At what point in your life did you determine that you were committed to a pro-life position? Was there a pivotal moment that established your view or was it more of a belief that gradually strengthened? Well, you know, I never actually thought that it was all right, even though I grew up in very liberal environments, you know, Detroit, Boston, New Haven, Ann Arbor, Baltimore. Uh, I still believe that uh, you didn't have the right to tell someone else what they should do, or what they should believe. But uh, that all changed uh, one day as a young attending neurosurgeon. I was thinking about the whole concept of slavery and how they didn't see slaves as actual individual inhuman beings. And uh, I thought, how similar is that to the way some people look at that precious life that is in the mother's womb? And I thought about the abolitionists. And what if the abolitionists had said, well, I don't believe in slavery myself, but I don't have any right to say what you should think. Where would we be as a society right now? We do have responsibilities. And as it says in the Bible, in the 24th chapter of Proverbs, verses 11 and 12, don't we know that there are people who are being ready to be slain, innocent people? And can we just say, oh, we don't know about it. It's, it's not our responsibility. And it says, does not he who sees and knows all know what you're doing? You know, that was enough to make me know that I have a responsibility to speak up for the innocent and not just to keep quiet. Absolutely. So given this deep personal uh, perspective that you are able to have on understanding the dignity of the human person, can you tell me a little bit about your reaction to the Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization decision? I mean, for all these years that you've so strongly believed that life began in the womb, did you ever think that you would see Roe v. Wade overturned? Well, uh, like many, I was overjoyed to hear that. I, I didn't know whether it would happen in my lifetime. I figured it would eventually happen at, at some point because more and more young people were finding out what actually goes on in that mother's room. I was actually uh, with Tony. Uh, Perkins at the Family Research Council when we got the news and there was an eruption in the audience of, of joy but you know we need to recognize that this is really only the beginning of the fight. All we actually did uh, the Supreme Court is return the decision making uh, to the states where it was supposed to be in the first place uh, but we still have work to do in each one of those states to try to defend the lives of these beautiful individuals who happen to be helpless and in the safest place in the universe where they can be. I absolutely agree with you that our work is far from over. And unfortunately, not everyone had the same positive reaction to the Dobbs decision as you and I did. In recent months, we've seen an uptick in the media and pro-abortion legislators claiming that abortion is the exact same thing as miscarriage management or treatment for ectopic pregnancies. Now, as a physician who has been actively pro-life and working in the medical field for decades, can you share your thoughts on the medical misinformation that the abortion industry has been spreading since the Dobbs decision? Well, it is definitely misinformation uh, because an ectopic pregnancy is a very different thing. This is where the uh, the embryo is embedded in the fallopian tube or someplace else that doesn't have the ability to sustain it. 
So it is uh, not going to survive under any circumstances in that location. And at the same time, it does pose a threat to the mother's life because uh, it can be associated with uh, massive hemorrhage. And uh, it's one of the few situations where, in fact, the mother's life uh, is imperiled. You hear that a lot by the pro-abortion people, that the mother's life is in danger and therefore the baby must be taken. You know, in all my years uh, of practicing medicine, uh, the only situations I ever saw uh, where there was peril, a potential peril to the mother's life, was with ectopic uh, pregnancies. So we need to definitely distinguish uh, between those two uh, different entities. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that medical perspective. You know, it's so important to have that in the pro-life movement. And another very common lie that the abortion industry has been spreading is that black women in particular need abortion in order to achieve equality. Now, Dr. Carson, as the former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, you know better than anyone what resources minority communities are really lacking. How would you respond to this idea that abortion is necessary for minority women to thrive or to achieve equality? It's really very asinine to, to even make a statement like that. Now, black women need abortions uh, to maximize their, their rights. Are you kidding me? What is happening is they are trying to dumb people down so that they don't think for themselves and so that they actually believe that these individuals who are telling them such nonsense have their best interest in mind. They clearly do not have their best interest in mind. And, you know, it's almost a sacred relationship between the mother and that baby that's in her womb. Closest human relationship that there can possibly be. And that mother's duty is to protect that baby to be the place of refuge for that baby, not to see that baby as an enemy and to kill that baby because it's inconvenient. This is just the opposite of what the intention was when God created us the way that he did. And we need to be very vocal about that and aggressive, just as aggressive as the people who want to kill babies are. And trying to understand them is, is very difficult. Why would someone want to kill another human being simply because it cannot speak, it cannot protect itself? You know, I was at a conference in South Africa and the head of the ACLU was proclaiming how wonderful the ACLU is because they speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. And uh, at the conclusion of his remarks, I stood up and said, what about little babies in the womb? They can't speak for themselves. Will you speak for them? And he fumbled around, but just would not actually answer the question. But of course, we all know what the answer is. And it's hard to even understand and to comprehend how people can do that. And I... It's kind of gross, but, you know, I kind of encourage people to actually look at a video of an abortion in the first trimester. You see the tube introduced into the uterus, and the baby tries to move away from it frequently before it latches onto a leg and tears it off, or an arm, or liver, and you see all the gore going down the tube. I mean, it is barbaric. And then in the second and third trimester, it was even worse than that because the tissues are too well formed to be removed by suction. So now you put a forceps into the womb and just grab whatever you can and twist and pull, and all of a sudden out comes a shoulder, out comes a foot, out comes a liver, and just tearing a human being apart. And we know in most cases, that these babies actually have a nervous system and they can feel. And they're more sophisticated even than a snail darter, 
these little creatures that the environmentalists go around trying to save, why not try to save these babies? Absolutely. It is completely horrific. And I'm grateful that you shared some of those details because I think, as you said, it's so important for us not to look away from them. And I think you also put it so beautifully that the abortion industry seeks to put enmity in the middle of that sacred relationship between the mother and child. Um, and it seems like the abortion industry's targeting of minority communities in particular has a lot to do with the disproportionate amount of abortions that they can um, successfully commit in these communities. I mean, we know that Planned Parenthood and other abortion businesses target minority women by placing their facilities near minority neighborhoods. Can you share your thoughts on why specifically the abortion industry determines that they should target minority women? Well, it's, it's really very sad, but... Uh... You know, the founder of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, was a eugenicist. And she felt that, uh, you know, people who were deformed, people who were mentally ill, and particularly black people, uh, should be eliminated, shouldn't be part of our society. She was a hero in Nazi Germany. And in one of her writings to a clergy member, it says, we need to be careful because we don't want people to find out that we want to exterminate the black people. And if they do find out, uh, we're going to need you and the ministry to sort of help smooth things over. Such barbaric uh, language and attitudes. And that's why the vast majority of the Planned Parenthood clinics are in minority neighborhoods. Uh, when you look uh, at this nation, uh, close to 40% of abortions are done on black women, and yet blacks only compose 12% of the population. So it's very disproportionate. And I hope that at some point that many in the black community will awaken and recognize that these people who purport to be your friends are actually the very ones who are trying to get rid of you. Absolutely. And I think that that's a perfect pivot to the next topic I wanted to cover, which is maternal mortality. Now, last year, my department at Family Research Council published a study on maternal mortality, where we explored the claim that unlimited abortion could lower maternal mortality rates. Now, as I'm sure you know, Washington, D.C. has some of the most lax abortion laws in the entire nation. An abortionist can kill an unborn child at any point in pregnancy for any reason. There's even an organization in the city that pays for women to have abortions for free. But we noted in our study that D.C.'s maternal mortality rate is more than 10 points higher than the national average, and D.C.'s black maternal mortality rate is nearly twice the national average for black women. Can you speak to the overall scarcity of basic resources in urban areas, such as food deserts and maternity care deserts? How is the push for abortion in the black community stealing resources away from improving real health care and human flourishing? Well, if in fact the amount of money, time, and energy devoted to killing babies were re-diverted to helping establish healthy families and family environments and support for babies, you would see a very uh, different number when it comes to those statistics that you just uh, acknowledged. And, you know, we have to find a way to once again bring back faith and family in our nation. Those are the things that are under severe attack. And uh, if you read a lot of the Marxist writings, uh, particularly 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, you'll see how they acknowledge that the United States of America was extraordinarily strong, would be very difficult to bring down because of their faith and their families. And that's why those are the things that have been under such severe attack. And we need to find a, a ways to encourage alternatives to abortion. It's very difficult, for instance, in the United States to adopt American babies. And it's very expensive. And that's why you see so many adoptions from foreign countries. We need to make it easy and expensive. There are a lot of families who would love to have these children that others want to throw away and would provide a most magnificent home setting for them. 
And we really need to pay attention to the things that we can do as a society to help alleviate this problem. Absolutely. I'm so glad that you covered that adoption topic as well. It is such an important component of what it means to be a pro-life movement in a post-Roe v. Wade America. Now, Dr. Carson, I'm sure you know that February is Black History Month. And you, of course, are someone that we look to with admiration all the time. But particularly during this month, we're excited to elevate your voice. You stand with Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King Jr. as a leader who fights for what is true and right and good in a culture that seems to be more broken every day. Now, abortion and race are perhaps the two greatest issues that divide our nation today. Would you share a bit about how the evil of abortion is deepening the divide in America? And from your perspective, what is the path to healing the divide on both abortion and race look like? Well, it's going to require leadership. That's what we don't have. We have people in leadership positions who say, we need unity. And then the next thing out of their mouth is, but those people are so evil or they're so bad. <laughs> it's just almost laughable. I don't think they even see how uh, hypocritical they appear to be. But the, the real answer lies with the people because each of us has a sphere of influence. No matter how meager your job or your position may be, there are people in your sphere of influence. And you can use that sphere of influence to help them to recognize the value of human life from the womb to the tomb, the value of all of those who live around us regardless of their ethnicity. You know, God gave us these very complex brains which make us different than animals. The way an animal's brain is structured, uh, they have very well-developed midbrain. Midbrain allows you to react. So animals react very quickly to what's going on in, in their environment, cat-like reflexes. We don't have those. But what we do have are those very sophisticated big frontal lobes, which give us the ability to engage in rational thought processing. And that's why when we look at someone, we don't have to react like an animal on the basis of their external physical characteristics. We can use that incredible brain to analyze the content of their character. And that's what Dr. King was talking about when he said he longed for the day when people would be judged not on the color of their skin, but the content of their character. God gave us a sophisticated intellectual mechanism to be able to do that. Wow, that's such interesting information and such an important perspective to hear. And I love the point you made as well about our sphere of influence. I think that's so important as a pro-life movement for us to consider. Um, and someone who used his sphere of influence exceptionally well was Frederick Douglass. In 1852, he gave his most famous speech titled, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? And it's a heartbreaking reflection on how African Americans couldn't celebrate Independence Day as easily as white Americans could because their independence and liberties weren't promised and their personhood had been ignored. So I'd like to close our conversation today by asking you, in 2023, what does the Fourth of July mean to an unborn child? And can you help us draw parallels between the moments in history when America has denied the personhood of some Americans? Well, in fact, the parallels are, are striking. Uh, and we're doing the very same thing again, denying the personhood of, you know, you think about it, a male gamete and a female gamete, both with 23 chromosomes neither with the ability to become a human being, but then they join and you have a full genetic complement, 46 chromosomes, a new individual, not part of the mother, not part of the father, happens to be in a very safe environment within the mother, but a completely new and different individual. And within a matter of six or eight weeks, you can see little eye sockets, little fingers and toes, the heart's beating. Soon after that, starts moving around. 
And by the time you've reached eight or nine months, you got somebody who could actually survive outside of the womb and very rapidly is developing with an incredibly sophisticated brain and neural network. And this is what we need to be thinking about, the miracle of life. And, you know, what Frederick Doug Douglass was certainly correct about the fact that Independence Day didn't mean very much for people who were not independent. But we're the ones who can change what Independence Day means for those who can't speak for themselves, who are totally helpless, who are dependent upon us. We are the ones who will decide what independence means for them. Well, that is a profound call to action that I think every pro-lifer listening to this needs to take upon themselves as we move forward into post-Roe v. Wade America. Dr. Carson, it has been a pleasure to speak with you today and to hear your perspective on some of the most pressing issues facing our nation. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me and keep up the great work.